Greetings, friends of liberty. One of the hazards of living in the 18th century is the enormous number of scams perpetrated by con men of all colors. Among the most notable of recent times having been that of Jean de Valois saint remy In this case, most intuitively we may say, cherchez la femme. Mastermind of the so-called affair of the diamond necklace, this alleged comtesse deceived the Cardinal Louis de Rouen into buying a necklace for the Queen, which she and her husband instead stole and promptly disposed of. In the end, the Comtesse escaped from prison and fled to London, dying after having fallen from her hotel window, attempting to evade debt collectors. Here, on the other hand, in the 21st century, college itself is a scam as Charlie Kirk, founder in 2012 of Turning Point USA, an organization with over a thousand collegiate chapters promoting conservative activism, describes at length in his multifaceted book on higher education. Kirk begins as Protestant revolutionary Martin Luther did in 1517 at the door of the Wittenberg Cathedral by posting theses about modern higher education, in this case 10 instead of 95. The first thesis is the title of the book itself, College is a Scam. And he asserts this by describing for many students the four stages of collegiate grief. They assume debt, they whittle their time away becoming less mature by playing beer pong and navigating the walk of shame. They receive a diploma and they take decades to whittle away at that debt. By putting it this way, Charlie emphasizes two aspects, the debt part and the motivation part, and asks, is the trade-off worth it for you? Charlie denies it is for many kids, since they should examine their own motives as to exactly why and how college can really help them achieve their life goals. He, however, admitting that if your intent is to receive a professional degree as a scientist, doctor, lawyer, engineer, that's different. However, it's not clear that this basic advice, don't go to college unless you know what you want, is always sound. Since in some cases, people start one major and then another, having realized by taking the first, they don't like it. Sort of like eventually breaking up with that gorgeous pothead majoring in Marxist dialectic. His second thesis is that education is ridiculously overpriced, and his third at taxpayer and student expense. Overpriced? Yes. And though we touched on that previously, he now gives numerous specific worst case scenarios. Parents owing 136,000 on behalf of their son, thus needing to take odd jobs well into their retirement years. Columbia film graduates owing 181,000 on average, or the homeless graduate with over 150,000 in debt, begging her friends to stay with them. One report by the Federal Reserve found that over 300,000 Americans could own homes if not for the need to service their college debt. Kirk fundamentally understanding that tuition is so high because, and I paraphrase, there is an excess of state money funding colleges. Which is why exactly so many go to college and why only 62 to 66 percent graduate. Remember that in most cases declaring bankruptcy will not erase that debt. No, sir, this debt can only be killed by retiring it. Unless, of course, a president of the United States wanting to boost his approval ratings forces the taxpayers to retire it for you. Of course, with many top colleges, in addition to being overpriced, they have huge endowments. Harvard at $41 billion in 2020, larger than the GDP of Latvia, Yale at $31 billion larger than Iceland, and Stanford at $28 billion larger than Zimbabwe. Are they really using that mountain of treasure productively? His fourth thesis, they don't educate. And fifth, relatedly, they ruin the ability to think and reason. Kirk implies he primarily discovered how bad college is by sitting in on classes for free, since he looked young enough and they don't check names for attendance. 
As a result, he compares collards to an ice cream cone not only undergoing shrinkflation, but where the manufacturer injects what remains in the cone with fillers. One survey showed no noticeable learning for 45% in their first two years, and another, similarly, no improvement even for many in elite schools after four years. Business leaders in their HR departments also commonly comment how bereft graduates are of productive skills. The good schools that still remain are not focused primarily on big time college sports or research programs, but simply on delivering excellent undergraduate instruction. Kirk adds hundreds of examples of woke thinking, such as that revealed by James Lindsay and Peter Boghossian in their Grievance Studies hoax, that found by feminist Katie Herzog in medical schools, which may deny basic facts of biology, the attacks on comedy figure SpongeBob SquarePants for being racist because the city called Bikini Bottom in his show, and Johnny Appleseed scorned as a colonizer because he planned lot, planted lots of apple trees and apple pie is a symbol of America. Yes, that's bad reasoning. His sixth thesis, Education Indoctrinates Students and Represses Speech, is partly a continuation of his examples of the previous chapter. He now adding a trove of incidents culled partly from the files of his own organization, Turning Point, which describe the attacks on harassment of or defamation by both students and university officials. His seventh thesis, College Fosters Violence and Hate, Given the irrationality of the left and the hothouse climate in which they thrive on the quad, it's not surprising to find both the incitement of and an actual catalog of woke assaults, batteries, and other felonies. Former philosophy professor Eric Clanton, time and again aiming for the noggin when physically striking conservatives, leftists attacking stalls, distributing leaflets, liberals playing music so loudly that it can damage hearing, and other assorted mischief, as in starting fires, verbal threats, or vehicular assaults. His eighth thesis, colleges have been partially influenced and compromised by disruptive groups from other countries, is by now well known, since we've heard of the CCP's 37 Confucius Institutes and their quasi-propaganda centers in 10 state universities and many more private of researchers such as Charles Lieber from Harvard hiding his involvement with the Yuhan Institute of Technology, scientists from MIT and Ohio State in data theft, and of the vast sums donated by questionable or rogue regimes like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, and mainland China. In his ninth thesis that colleges create and let loose Antifa BLM and other activists, Kirk again gives us a lengthy list of lefty bad behavior, which would surprise no one. Conservatives being harassed in restaurants or online, academic Antifa's encouraging the violence of their students, and of course, the toppling of statues. Finally, in his 10th thesis, he notes that teachers are liberal extremists bent on indoctrinating students, a bit redundant by now, and he relates the helpful Turning Point USA habit of assembling a professor watch list of leftist radical academics that anyone can access. He shares a number of these profiles with us. To be forewarned professorially is to be forearmed pedagogically. In conclusion, are there any criticisms? Well, firstly, he locates the origin of critical race theory in the 1978 Supreme Court decision of Bakke, when instead it's firstly just a natural outgrowth of the flood of federal monies that created hundreds of black studies and other woke departments in the 70s and 80s, secondly in college's nonprofit status, which more easily allows the institutional feather bedding that creates these departments, and finally in addition the passages of Title 7 and 9, which also gave legal impetus towards all this. In his final chapters, he gives examples of successful people outside of college, and surely 
these occupations might be conceivable for some students. But overall, most people don't start a business, and there are only so many tradesmen or soldiers a society needs. Thirdly, Charlie's apparently always right. There's no self-deprecating humor and almost no jokes. And often, others are shown in a bad light when dealing with him, typical examples being people are said to laugh uproariously when he asks whether they want their sons to become plumbers. His peers are flabbergasted when they learn he didn't go to college, and no one will stand up to the system. Only someone who has no skin in the game, like Mr. Kirk. However, in the third to last page of the book, when addressing his solutions, Charlie mentions two of the very points I've made in the various versions of my videos, removing the tax exemptions for colleges and abolishing what he calls federal guarantees for student loans. Now, if by this he means privatizing all student loans, that's exactly right. Given this insightful revelation in the last three pages, I'd give this book a B, it trotting a well-worn contrarian path in a competent and colorful manner. On that affirming note, I bid you all well and remain as ever, the Scarlet Pimpernel.